Most of us have electronic devices of one sort or another that we, we use every day, whether it's computer or game console or smart TV or speaker. I mean, even, even refrigerators now, right? Um, but of course, the thing is that the programming that runs those machines it's not always reliable, right? It can, a glitch can cause it to freeze up. It's like it gets in some sort of loop and you try tapping the button or the screen or entering commands and there's just no response. Right? Now, restarting it normally helps. That normally gets it working again, but sometimes the problem's more serious, right? It might be infected with a virus that you hear people talk about, right? So it's this, this malicious code that sort of embeds itself in the system and, and keeps the device from doing what it's designed to do. And at that point, the only solution might be to just reformat the hard drive, to wipe it clean, to erase it, and to start over. You know, I think when God gave the people of Israel the Ten Commandments, it was sort of like he was giving them the opportunity to reformat their soul. I mean, think about it. They had been living in Egypt, the, the, their, with their descendants, or their ancestors at least, had been living there for 400 years. And so their worldview had undoubtedly been infected by that culture. And I mean, that happens to all of us. We just tend to absorb our society's ways of thinking. And we don't even recognize it. We, we begin to to accept the society's ways of thinking about what's true and what's real and what's good. And, and some of those things are okay, but, but some of them are, are malicious, right? They're like that virus, that, that bad code that sort of embeds itself in your mind and gets you caught up in vicious cycles that lead you far from your creator's design for your life. And so when God rescues us, the way spiritual growth works is that we have to erase the old programming. <laughs> we have to start over. We need new parameters to rework our entire outlook. Right? It's like reformatting your soul. Paul described that process in Romans 12 too by saying, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so the Ten Commandments, then, are the boundaries that we need. They're, they're not just rules, they express the will of God, like Paul was talking about there in Romans 12 too. They define what it means to live in a relationship with Him. They're, they're like a spiritual operating system for your life. Right? They, they give us a worldview, a system of beliefs and values to guide us. And they start by addressing our fundamental perception of reality. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3, tells us this, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, we say that there are 10 commandments because that number is mentioned over in Exodus 34, 28, and in Deuteronomy 10. It, it, it literally refers to, to this passage as the 10 words. But the funny thing is different groups actually divide it up different ways. Uh, so the, the Jewish Talmud, uh, Jewish rabbis, took verse 2 as the first of the words, even though there's no imperative in it. It just says, I am the Lord your God. Uh, and, and then they take verse 3 as, they, as part of the second commandment. But Christians have generally taken verse 2 as, as an introduction to the commandments, and particularly to the first commandment. But then Catholics and Lutherans say that the first commandment begins in verse 3 and goes all the way down through verse 6. But on the tail end, that forces them then to go down to, uh, to verse 17, uh, the part about coveting, and to split it up into two separate commandments. 
So the Orthodox Church and Protestant groups have, have generally understood verse 3 alone as the first commandment. And I, I think that's the best approach. That's the way we're looking at it today. Now, as we work our way through the commandments or the ten words, we'll, we'll follow a basic pattern each time. Uh, first, we'll identify the, the limitation the boundary that the commandment establishes. And and, and we'll notice how that restriction is then expressed in more specific terms in the rest of chapter 20 and in chapters 21 through 23, what's called the book of the covenant. Then we'll consider uh, the revelation. In other words, what the commandments uh, show us or teach us about the character of God and our relationship with him. And then then we can reflect upon the application of that command for us today as those who seek to follow the law of Christ under the new covenant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in looking at that first commandment, then the question is, the, the limitation should be fairly obvious to us. It's no other gods. Now, you know, wherever you go in the world, I think... There's one thing that, that we all share in common. People all talk about the weather, right? I mean, you know how it is. On good days, we're, we're grateful. We talk about how good it is, right? And then there's the rest of the time when we complain about it, right? Because it's too hot or it's too cold, right? Like this morning, it's too wet or it's too dry, And you know how it is, an unexpected storm comes along and it just spoils your plans for an afternoon, Uh, but the stakes are so much higher for someone who's trying to grow crops in a field, right? I mean, particularly in ancient times, bad weather could lead to famine and starvation. And so people have always looked for ways to, to understand and even control the weather. And, you know, the common view in ancient times was that there were uh, different spirits or deities that controlled the elements of nature, the sun and the storms and animals and the fertility of the fields and all those sorts of things. And so people tried to figure out how to keep those capricious gods or spirits that they imagined to be there, how to keep them happy and satisfied. And they made physical representations of them, idols. They paid homage to them in various uh, rituals. They gave offerings to them. They built temples and established priesthoods. But the goal was always to get those gods to do what you wanted. Right? <laughs> it was always to get them to go along with your will and what you wanted. That's how it worked. So how did that worldview come about? Well, if we look back in the scripture, the first mention of other gods in the Bible is in Genesis 31. And it's where we're told that Jacob's wife, Rachel, stole her father's household idols. It just says her father's gods. She, they were able to be stolen, right? Because they were just statues. And so it was already kind of a part of normal daily life by that point for people in the ancient world. And so looking back further in the scripture, I think the worship of false gods can probably be traced back to the building of the Tower of Babel that's recorded for us in Genesis chapter 11. In verse 4 of that chapter, it describes the people's motives by saying, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, some scholars explain that phrase, making a name for themselves, as as just sort of establishing a great reputation, you know, or or good branding, right? Uh, Something to unify them. But if you follow the flow of the book, all the people in the world, were it was, they had come out of the flood after Noah. They were all still unified at that point with one language. So to me, that doesn't quite make sense. Who would they be trying to impress with this great name? And so I think the name that they were making when it says that was really talking about 
establishing a new deity, a new God. Rather than calling upon the name of the Lord, like it talks about earlier in Genesis, they were making a new name and a lofty temple, this tower to go with it in the hopes that it would enable them to exert some sort of control over their environment. Of course, just as Satan tempted Eve, he's also the one ultimately behind the worship of false gods. When you read through the Bible, polytheism was this constant temptation for the people of Israel throughout their history. I mean, you even see kings like Solomon succumb to it. As they interact with other nations, Adopting that nation's gods would sometimes be part of an alliance. Uh, In Solomon's case, it came about through his foreign wives that he married, contrary to what God had told him to do. And so you come to the New Testament, polytheism is still very common in the Greco-Roman society. We're probably more familiar with with those deities. Um, And one of the big disputes in the early church was whether they could eat food that had been offered to idols. And Paul has a lot to say about that in 1 Corinthians 8 and uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 14. But this one passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 19 through 20, it helps us, I think. He, He says this, what do I imply then, that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. So it just gives us a sense of of what's behind the the worship of idols, false gods. And of course, the sad reality of it, of polytheism, is that it traps people in dread and uncertainty. There's no sense of any sort of relationship with those deities. People don't even have any real idea of how they, for, how they could truly satisfy those spirits. In fact, they, honoring one deity might even provoke another. It's this hopeless system. And so in his goodness, the Lord draws a clear line with this first commandment. The people of Israel were not supposed to have any other gods. Now, when you look at this verse, verse 3 at the commandment, you might understand you shall have no other gods before me as a claim of priority, right? Sometimes we talk about making God first in our life, and, and that's certainly a good thing, but the Lord didn't just want his people to acknowledge him as, as the highest among other gods, He wanted them to reject those false gods entirely. And so some English translations will will change before me and translate it as besides me. You might even have that note in the margin of your Bible. We have to understand that this is a claim of exclusivity, not of priority. And that understanding, that interpretation is really supported as we go down into the rest of the book of the covenant and look at other verses. They weren't supposed to treat the Lord as like this king of a pantheon of gods. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 23 tells us that the Lord told Moses, you shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. The Lord's even more explicit down in Exodus 22, verse 20. There he says, Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. So you see, God wanted Israel's leaders uh, not only to adopt this worldview, but to enforce it in their nation. The worship of other gods was punishable by death. And so too were other idolatrous practices. When they were in Egypt, sorcery had been a prominent part of life there. I mean, remember the the court magicians were somehow able to copy some of uh, a few of the miracles that, that the Lord brought about through Moses, the early ones. And eventually they reached a point where the plagues got too great and they couldn't copy them. 
Right? Well, in Exodus 22, 18, jumping back a few verses here, it simply says, the Lord says, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. It was so important for them to leave that old life, that old way of thinking behind that Exodus 23, 13 tells us that the Lord said, pay attention to all that I've said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Now, I, I don't think the command was really prohibiting any reference to those gods, because as you go through the Old Testament, there are other passages where it does name uh, some of those false gods. Uh, but the point is that they weren't supposed to be invoked. They weren't supposed to be addressed. They weren't supposed to be reverenced or honored in any way. Right? They were not supposed to have any place in the lives of God's people. Now, as I explained last week, New Testament believers are not under that same covenant. We're not under those laws. They were part of God's covenant with Israel. Right? So just to be clear, we should understand that the church has no authority to carry out executions. <laughs> Right? And God doesn't call Christians to turn earthly nations into Old Testament theocracies. That's not the point. But at the same time, we do need to consider what this limitation in the Mosaic law reveals about the Lord. And I think this simple idea here, the revelation, is that the Lord is God. I don't know if, you've, if you have bad eyesight. You, you know, sometimes you can get so accustomed to it that you're just used to things being blurry. Right? It might, might give you a headache. Signs might be hard to read on the road. In extreme case, you might even limit where you go. But yet, when, when you go into an optometrist and they click the right lens into place, and all of a sudden, everything becomes clear. Right? The first commandment, I think, has that kind of power to it. It's like a corrective lens to help you see the way things really are. Because by rejecting other gods, the first commandment reveals that the Lord alone is God. But the thing we need to consider as we think about that is, what does it mean to be God? Right? How do you define God. Under polytheism, a god was just one of several competing spiritual beings, each with its own limited power. But the God of the Bible is so much more than that. He's, he's the creator of all things. Right? That's where the Bible begins. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a fundamental truth. And that work of creation establishes his ownership and his authority over everything that exists. In fact, when you look at the Old Testament prophets, and then even later the Apostle Paul, they use the idea of God's work of creation to rebuke people who worship idols. But interesting, there's no mention of that or indication of that or tie-in here with the first commandment. Maybe the Lord doesn't make that connection because, as Paul says, uh, even with the evidence of, of his work of creation, people still suppress the truth, right? Paul talks about that in Romans 1. And later on, we'll see that the fourth commandment actually goes back and highlights creation as support for the Sabbath. But the first commandment here is linked to two other actions that I think show us that the Lord is God. The first demonstration of his deity is that he spoke. Exodus 19, we looked at it a few weeks ago, tells us that the people had gathered around the foot of the mountain to meet God. They saw lightning and thick cloud, fire and smoke. They heard thunder and this piercing trumpet blast. They felt the mountain itself tremble. And Moses had gone up to the Lord and had come back down and warned them to not break through the limits. And then Exodus 
20, 1 and 2 makes, make this point so simply that we might miss its powerful significance. It says, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. So the people of Israel, it wasn't like they were just listening to the ramblings of some mystic or speculations of some self-proclaimed prophet. The entire nation heard the voice of God. And the first thing he says in all of their hearing is that he identifies himself by saying, I am the Lord. And when we see Lord in all capital letters like that in our English Bible, it signifies the name Yahweh. It's a personal name. That's who he is. And this whole experience of hearing God speak terrified the people. If we jump down to verse 18... 18 and 19, it says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not, do not let God speak to us lest we die. So it was a terrifying experience. And yet it had a clear purpose. The next verse, verse 20, tells us Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. Right? So hearing the Lord speak was designed to instill in them this proper fear of him as the one true God. And then as Moses returns and the Lord begins to speak with them, it tells us this as we keep reading verses 21 through 23. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people, You have seen for yourselves, what? That I have talked with you from heaven. And then he says, You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold, as we read a moment ago. So the point is that the, the Lord did what no false god had ever done or nor could ever do. He'd spoken. He was making himself known and his will known. And he did so audibly there at Sinai. Right now, after that, as the people request, the Lord begins to speak through Moses and through other Old Testament prophets later on, and then the apostles in the New Testament. Right? He spoke to us in an even greater way through his son. Like John 1 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us to make God known. That's a key element of who he is as God, that he, he is knowable, he has spoken, he has made himself known. And then the second demonstration of his deity, of the Lord's deity, was what he had already done for the people of Israel. He saved them. Right? If we look again at, at verse 2 of the chapter, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. See, false gods, they don't save people. Right? In fact, under polytheism, people did things to try to save themselves from the gods. That was how the system worked. But here that's reversed. The Lord, in his grace, rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. He expressed his judgment upon their oppressors through the ten plagues. He parted the Red Sea for them. He provided for them in the wilderness. He did it all so that they would relate to him as the one and only God. Now, of course, the demonstration of God's saving purpose becomes even clearer in, in the New Testament. In Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, Paul explains what the Lord has done to rescue us from our slavery, our spiritual slavery, 
He puts it this way, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Then he says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So the first commandment then draws a line. It forbids the worship of other gods, but at the same time, it points us toward a worldview that sees Yahweh as the one true God, the God who has spoken, who's provided salvation to lead us into a relationship with him forever. So how do we respond to that revelation? I think we can describe the application today as faith and fear. I shared this before, but when I was growing up in Southern California, I spent a lot of time uh, at the beach, playing in the surf, loved being in the waves, floating over them, diving through them. But sometimes the waves grew large enough and intense enough that it just wasn't fun anymore. (laughs) Because they would, they would sweep you off your feet and leave you tumbling in the water. Uh, and you, in those moments, you lose all sense of direction. You begin to panic trying to, gra- trying to get a breath. And, and you just can't tell which way is up. And I think, I think our culture can have the same sort of effect on us. Uh, it can sweep us off our feet in a similar way. It, it kind of comes in waves, you know, whether it's intellectual or political or relational, moral, even false spirituality. They're just these trends in society. Right? And when they hit, we can lose our sense of direction. Uh, we can begin to panic or, or feel a sense of desperation. We grasp at things to, to help and lash out at anyone who gets in the way. And, and so to find stability, to catch your breath, you need to know which way is up. And that's, that's what the first commandment does. It points us in the right direction. Right? In contrast to false gods, we've seen that the Lord's deity is shown in that he speaks and he saves. And so the response to that, the application, is faith. We should believe in his existence and in his gracious desire to have a relationship with us. We should accept his word as our standard of of what's right and what's good and what's true. We should trust him as our savior to protect us and to provide for us. Now, even before the people of Israel reached Mount Sinai, they, the Lord was already teaching them all of this. He was teaching them to trust Him. Right? They experienced His protection through the plagues. And when they crossed the Red Sea, and He provided supernaturally, gave them bread from heaven, the manna and the meat. And He provided water for them from a rock all during that wilderness journey. And in chapter 19, Moses tells them that that God wants them to be his treasured possession. And yet, when they see the Lord there on Sinai, right, it tests their faith. Do they really believe those things that the Lord had revealed about himself? Let's look again at verses 19 through 20 of Exodus 20 there. The people said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And then in verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you 
What does that mean? Well, rather than being afraid, they need to trust God. Would they believe in his promise and his saving purpose? Would they rely upon what they'd learned about his goodness and grace through their experiences? And so even though we don't see the glory of God in that way that they did at Sinai, in our daily lives now, we, we face, still face the same basic test. Will we trust the Lord? Will we accept what he's revealed about himself as God? Hebrews 11.6 in the New Testament tells us, without faith, it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So an essential part of relating to the Lord as God is just trusting him. We should trust the Lord for everything, all the time, just because he's God. But at the same time, it's it's possible to say that you believe in the Lord without really relying upon him at all. You know what I mean? Your, your, Your faith, so to speak, could be anchored in any number of things. The thing that you really draw strength from might be your spouse, your parents, your children, your friends, maybe your job or your your bank account, right? A counselor, a doctor, science in general, right? The government, or just, just plain your own wisdom and strength, your ability to figure things out and get by. And those things are all good if if you receive them as blessings from God. But but if any of those things really truly become the object of your faith, the thing that you're depending on, then you have to see that you're treating that person or thing as your God. You're violating the first commandment when you're trusting something else other than God, when you're giving it the place that he deserves in your life. So the second application of the first commandment that I'd highlight is is fear. That seems to contradict what we just talked about about faith, right? But Moses expresses this paradox back there in verse 20. Look at it again. He says to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Well, what does that mean? How is it possible to not fear and fear at the same time? I mean, Moses didn't use two different Hebrew words there. There's no, uh, you know, it's just as confusing in the original language as it is in English, (laughs) But I think the context helps us understand here. The first fear is that terror that would drive someone away from God. Right? That fear is the opposite of faith. Don't run away in terror. Trust him. But the second fear that he talks about in a positive sense is a reverence for God that leads someone to obey him, right? to respect him. That fear is a result of faith. Proverbs 3 7 captures the idea of that by saying, Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. And so, this humble, obedient fear of the Lord is another essential part of what it means to relate to Him as God. But what are we doing when we turn away from the fear? of the Lord. I mean, what does it say when we give way to temptation, when we commit a sinful deed? There again, in those moments, what's happening is, is we're not really treating him as God. The Apostle Paul makes that connection in Colossians 3, 5. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, 
sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Right? Idolatry. At, the, at its core, you have to see that every sin is an act of idolatry. Right? You're, you're not bowing down to a statue, but you're exalting your own personal desires above the will of God. Really, what you're doing is you're relating to yourself as your own God in those moments, right? And that violates the first commandment too. Right? That's what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. They made their own desires, their own judgments above God's. Right? That's, what, that's the inclination of our flesh. We all fight that impulse all the time. And so what do you do when you realize that your faith has been misplaced? Right, that's been in, in the wrong, it hasn't been in the Lord. Or when you're not walking in the fear of the Lord, you turn away from your idol. You turn back to God. You place your faith in Him and in His Son. You trust His promise. You trust the gospel, the good news that Jesus paid the penalty for our idolatry through His death so that we could be forgiven and reconciled with God. Right? And then by the power of the Spirit, you begin to walk in the fear of the Lord, seeking to put to death those earthly desires, as Paul talks about there. And when you stumble into sin again, because you will, right, then you turn back to God again. And you keep doing it. This Christian life is one of continual repentance and renewal. We have to keep walking in faith and fear. We have to keep coming back to it over and over again. So do you need to reformat your soul? Right, start with the first commandment. Confess the ways that you've crossed the limit by allowing something or someone to take God's place in your life. Remind yourself that basic idea that the Lord is God. That he's spoken and he's provided salvation. And so place your faith in him and walk in the fear of the Lord. If you've never done so, I urge you to turn to God today, to turn to the Lord, to put aside those idols, whatever shape or form they may take. And trust in his saving grace. If you're new to Christianity, you want to learn more about God's existence, about how we should relate to him, I'd encourage you to take a look at, at uh, Acts 17 in the New Testament. That chapter is also great preparation for our study of the second commandment next time. If you're a believer, do you need to renew your devotion to the Lord I mean, like I say, our flesh keeps pulling us back towards some kind of idolatry, but we have to fight it through repentance and faith. We keep coming back. Maybe you need to make a fundamental change in your worldview. Right? Satan works through the world to provide all sorts of idols and all sorts of excuses to justify sinful behavior. Right? And sometimes we need that reformatting to align my heart and mind again with the commands of God and His truth. We have to anchor our hearts and minds in His Word. May God help us to relate to Him as the one true and living God.